Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so in this session, I'll be discussing about API governance and the monetization. So if I tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Sanjeev Mahagada. So I'm responsible for WC API Manager product, as well as the APK, as a technical product owner. Uh, so I was working for WC for more than 14 years, uh, as of today. Uh, so my primary technology focus areas, including API management integration, Docker Kubernetes, and also a bit of API gateway aspects as well. So I would like to invite you all to connect with me uh, through LinkedIn and Twitter. So this is uh, our agenda for today's session. Uh, so I'll start with the brief history and the evolution of the API management. So then I'll discuss how API evolved as digital product. And then I'll discuss about the API governance and practical usages of API governance. So then uh, I'll try to come up with the set of framework for API governance. It's not the, like, the exact framework that you should follow. But I'll try my best to come up with a set of best practices and the guidelines and uh, come up with the standard framework for uh, you all to follow. So then I'll discuss about API revenue and the monetization, because uh, these things are also going hand in hand with the API governance as well. So then I'll discuss about what kind of support you need from API management platform to support API uh, monetization, and how you could effectively implement API monetization strategy within your organization. Okay. So evolution of the API management. So uh, I think uh, if we look at the current uh, API management or the API management uh, uh, process that we are following, uh, so that all started way back in 2010. So I know history of APIs basically go back to 1960s. And uh, uh, that time, we had like uh, different interfaces to communicate. So even if you look at the DLL and all, they all are following some sort of APIs. But the API management or the web API management that we are following today mostly started way back in 2010. So back then, uh, uh, most of the organizations were developing their web services. I think you all are familiar with this concept. So they all developing their web services. And within the web service itself, they included uh, some authentication rate limiting and uh, other quality of services that we are doing now in the API management layer. So th back then, uh, so one of the most difficult thing uh, we had to do is people to convince using API management platform. So they were like, okay, uh, so as of today, I am doing everything within my web services framework. So I have filters to do that. Uh, some of these rate limit policies I have included in my application logic itself. So why I need separate API management platform to do this kind of thing? So those are the most common questions these people ask uh, when we go to on-site or when we try to do some kind of a consultancy or anything like that. So, so this, uh, this is about like 2010-12 time frame. So I was working with at that time uh, with one of the leading e-commerce platform. Uh, so in, in their environment, uh, they were trying to build their next generation API management platform. At the same time, I had to work with the backend team as well. So backend teams were like, OK, I have my JaxRS service, and I have JaxRS filter to do authentication. Uh, why we need this? So then we had to uh, have this conversation with them and try to understand, uh, try to explain them uh, what are the possible problems associated with that approach. So basically, we were, we were explaining about like, OK, you have security and authentication for the, this API. But if you want to do the same for the next API, what you should do? How hard to uh, take this code, authentication code, to next environment? And then we discuss about uh, some of the features, like uh, how you uh, share your authentication tokens, how you share your access credentials with other developers. So then they were like, uh, OK, we are sharing through the emails. So they request access, then we share that through the emails and all. So that kind of conversation went. So then uh, we discuss about like uh, how if we have something like self-care portal. So how we feel let users to uh, do that by themselves. Basically, uh, what if we have a process to uh, go to some kind of a portal, self-service portal, and sign up by themselves? Then uh, they can pick whatever APIs they need, and then uh, they can start consuming it. Why, why we can't have that kind of thing? So then I, uh, what we saw was over the time, uh, people started uh, using APIs and the API management platform and uh, trying to uh, implement API management strategy across uh, different organizations. So these are some of the questions we asked back then, like how, how you address the security, how you do security from one to another. Uh, when it comes to consumption, how easy uh, for your consumers to consume these APIs and all. So these are the, some of the questions we had, uh, we asked back then. 
So then over the time, uh, API management evolved. And uh, uh, when, when that happened, actually backend developers also got more freedom. So now they can focus their business logic. So previously, they were worrying about authentication, authorization, rate limit, all these things within their services itself. So now they don't need to worry about that. They can completely focus on their business logic, while API management layer take care about the API-related quality of services. So then over the time, uh, most of the responsibilities came to uh, API management product. So if you look at here, uh, we started with uh, basically authentication and rate limiting path. So our own experience, so we, we actually did our first API manager release uh, 2012, if I remember correctly. So at that time, we started with the authentication and authorization and the rate limiting only. So then over the time, uh, most of these requirements uh, grow over the time. So then anomaly detection came, then after some time, analytics and data capture requirements came. So login, tracing, business insight, so all these things, including the runtime as aspect, uh, started. Uh, I mean, it started then. Uh, we are working on the API layer. In addition to that, uh, consume engagement side also uh, evolved. So basically, we start with the basic portals, and then over the time, uh, people want to have like uh, uh, invitation capabilities. Like, let's say you want to onboard new user, you invite to them, so they come to your portal, sign up, and they start using your API. So then most recently, we did some uh, AI-related improvements as well, where you explain your requirements in natural language so that we can find the best API for you. So likewise, uh, uh, API management layer uh, become more and more feature-rich. And uh, some of the features from the backend layer uh, came to this side, as well as uh, between the client and backend. Back then, uh, we had uh, load balances and firewall. So some of the load balance and firewall capabilities also came to API management layer. So then after API management layer, sometimes we have integration layer. Some capabilities of the integration layer also came into API management layer. So I'm trying to uh, explain all these things, like how these relate to governance and uh, why governance is important. So then uh, once people start adapting API management solution, uh, then uh, APIs uh, become the an interaction point for your organization with the outside. So initially, we started these things as a technical interfaces. And over the time, it became real digital product uh, that you can sell. So APIs uh, started as a technical interfaces and evolved to uh, digital products that you sell outside. So that means almost all the characteristics of the digital product apply now to API management as well, APIs as well. So that means uh, some aspect like the documentation and uh, usability, uh, usage guide and uh, uh, business value that it delivers to customer. So all these things people expect from the APIs as well. So then uh, uh, sometimes APIs, uh, like I said, it started as a technical interface. But from the customers, they got different requirements. So for example, I need to find my uh, uh, like the weather details based on the geolocation. So those are more like a customer requirement. So on the other hand, uh, in the technical side, we have some capabilities. So now API is shaped into uh, these customer uh, requirements. That is what I mentioned as a customer orientation. So now APIs are designing mostly to cover the exact customer use cases, not to expose what you have in your organization, not to expose your data directly outside. So rather we focus on the customer requirement and we're trying to address their requirement. Through that, uh, we get the revenue. So then, uh, when you expose this product to outside and uh, make it a sellable product, you need to take care about the quality of that. So governance became more and more prominent when APIs became uh, digital products. So basically, governance introduced uh, two different ways. So one way is to uh, establish the set of guidelines. So when you develop APIs, what kind of guideline you should follow? So that angle, that is one angle. So other angle is the enforcement of best practices. So for example, when you publish API, uh, uh, mandating documents. Because without document, uh, consumers cannot use that API. So, so both these angles covered, and uh, governance plays a crucial role uh, when we consider both these aspects. So then if you look at why we need governance in the API management space, uh, I would like to list uh, these, like, these are some uh, main points. So security is one main thing. 
So when you expose your API to outside, you are exposing your data. So that means security is very important because if you miss something, then people get your data outside. So they can modify your data, they can access your data. So then security is very important thing. So governance around the security uh, became very important. So it can, we can start with some simple stuff like mandating HTTPS, disabling HTTP, something like that. And it can go all the way up to like having fine-grained, cross-grained uh, permission model for each and every resources. So then the consistency. So if you start with the one API, and next day when you go to another API, if the experience is different, resource representation model is different, it will be kind of uh, not really easy for you to consume these APIs. So maintain the consistency is one, one other angle. So reliability, of course, when you uh, sell some product, reliability matters because people pay for that and they expect reliability of that API as well. So then uh, visibility. So when we discuss about the visibility, we can think about something like uh, adding proper description or tags for your APIs. Uh, without these descriptions or tags, people cannot consume your API because they cannot find what, what they need. And as a result, they cannot consume your API. So these are very important. So governance around all these aspects, uh, people started working on. So then uh, eventually, it can, reduce, it can cost uh, to uh, cost reductions as well. Because uh, so if you follow all these things, then you will have a very robust API system. So as a result, you won't have the security incidents. So then it affects to your goodwill, your reputation in the industry. Because if some attack happen one day, next day your reputation may go down. And as a result, you may uh, get a like, lot of financial loss, as well as the brand damage as well. So these are some of the uh, areas why we really need uh, governance. So then I'll discuss a bit about uh, some of our own experience and uh, like some cases uh, related to governance and some impact of the governance. So recently, uh, when, we, when we speak with one of our own users, they mentioned that uh, in their environment, they got around 1,000 APIs. But they are pretty sure they won't need 1,000 APIs. So what happened was, over the time, uh, they developed so many APIs. And uh, after some time, organization, I mean, people, people change, organization structures change but this API stays there. So they did not have proper process to uh, uh, retire these APIs. So as a result, so many APIs accumulated. Some people don't even know why these APIs are there. So this kind of situation can happen to any organization because uh, uh, having this kind of zombie APIs, or we call them zombie APIs or the abundant APIs. Uh, so if you have this kind of APIs, and uh, if you can't track them properly, it can cause uh, security issues as well. So if you all remember uh, like 2020-21 uh, uh, time frame, uh, there were like major data breach happened with the, one of the famous uh, social media. So what happened in that case was uh, they had uh, internal developer, uh, external developer APIs that they exposed to outside. And uh, through that API, developers can pull some user data. So after some time, they realized these APIs are no longer needed and they retired those APIs. But due to some issues with their process, they missed a few APIs related to this one. So finally, some attackers found these APIs, and uh, they were able to scrape data through that. So I think uh, with that incident, around uh, 10 million data, uh, user data, uh, they took outside. So as a result, uh, there was like a big problem happened and uh, it affects to company reputation as well. So my point is, when you have uh, like a large API ecosystem, you need to uh, focus on this angle as well. So and uh, there was another incident, 2021, if you all remember, uh, there were some famous figures, they were uh, like uh, doing social posts saying, if you deposit me $1,000, I will deposit you $2,000. I, I think you all remember that incident. So in that case also, what happened was, uh, there was internal API, uh, that they used to uh, track, track or modify the verified account content, someone somehow get access to that, and uh, through that, all these things happen. So likewise, uh, paying attention to all your data, all your API is very important. So, uh, so it is very important in present era, uh, because if you look at the last 10 years, we were developing and uh, deploying APIs in accelerated rate. Because uh, if you look at uh, time from 2005-06 uh, time to now, I think within this period, 
uh, we created most of the APIs available today. I mean, it's a massive API amount. Almost all the organizations, they started the API journey uh, early 2010 uh, time frame, and by now, they may have so many APIs. So they don't know why we have this API. So uh, what I see is, uh, while we are adapting new API governance technologies, we should always focus on what we have, what we already have, what we already developed. Because somehow, somewhere, there can be developers or attackers they, who may know how to invoke these APIs. So because every time when you create API, you open some hole to your system, some way to scrape your data. right? So you have to take care about these things. So while you are uh, following uh, best practices related to API governance for your new APIs, I would recommend you to uh, look back and see uh, what you already created and have a proper ground governance for that. So the, this user I mentioned earlier, having 1,000 APIs, so now they work with us to build, uh, so our, we have API uh, governance tool. So now they need to run API governance tool for all their 1,000 APIs and see whether these APIs follow uh, best practices. Like, are they coming with the security? Is there any uh, like uh, uh, APIs people not using? So that kind of uh, process or the implementation you need to start now. So that is uh, my suggestion for you all. So then let's try to uh, come up with the basic framework for API governance. Uh, because, uh, so like I said earlier, API governance is not just uh, a simple thing. So you should start that from API design phase, and you should go all the way up to the API retirement phase. So because each and every phase, we do very important thing uh, related to API. So for example, if we take the design phase, in the design phase, we start uh, like uh, creating API definition. So when you create your API definition, you can do some simple things like uh, uh, enabling specific schemes, like uh, disabling HTTP, some simple stuff like that. And also, you can make sure whether you have proper uh, scopes associated for each and every resources in your API, how you did that, whether it's completed. So once you complete only, you should go to next layer. So you should apply governance to uh, design pace as well. So then API comes to development layer. So when it comes to development layer, sometimes we do coding, code changes as well. Uh, so we need to uh, focus on that as well. So when it comes to testing, again, there can be things you do. I mean, uh, uh, you can do the auditing, you can do compliance check. Uh, all the testing related aspect, you need to focus. So you need to have governance policy around uh, that area as well. So then again, when it comes to deployment, Again, we should check whether we have a proper pipeline. So is there any way uh, someone can inject some code during the pipeline process as well? So are we using automation for that? Uh, how, how secure that automation? So you should apply the governance around uh, deployment side as well. So then when it comes to consumption, again, we should have some governance validation uh, just to make sure whether we have the right documentation, uh, right samples, right SDKs. So we should govern all these things as API management platform. So then most importantly, uh, when you retire API, uh, you should focus on the governance as well. Because if you, uh, if the, if I, if you remember the previous examples I discussed, if they retired their APIs properly, they won't see this issue. Because that API is, I, I mean, if they retired properly with this proper sunset plan and all, that API won't be there and attackers won't get access to that data. So then at the retirement phase, Again, there are, there are things you should do. So for example, you should see uh, these APIs are actively used. So if you have multiple versions, let's say you got version 1, 2, 3, 4, and all, uh, before retiring, you should have a mechanism to check which API is being used. Do we have active users for this particular version? And if we have users, how we can communicate with these users? Uh, whether we should send deprecation or to them? How we can do that? So as an API management platform, we should support all these things. Uh, so then uh, coming up with proper sunset plan, see uh, like how we can properly deprecate that. Are we completely removing artifact and everything from that API data? data? So likewise, uh, you need to focus on the uh, retirement phase as well. So this is a very basic one. And uh, if you start following this practice and uh, see how it affects your organization and uh, try to come up with your own solution, I think that would be the best. As an organization, we cannot tell you what exactly suit for you. So that depends from one, one organization to another, one person to another. 
So you can have this kind of basic framework and build your API governance strategy uh, on top of this framework. So then I'll discuss a bit about uh, future direction of the API, uh, API governance. Uh, so like any other uh, industry or any other technology area, AI is impacting a uh, huge, uh, the AI doing huge impact on this area as well. Uh, because if you look at the API schema validation uh, the, and the API uh, development uh, testing part, so all these things you can easily automate with the AI. So as of today, we are doing some experiment with uh, AI uh, governance tool, and uh, we hope to use the AI and other smart technologies in the future. Uh, so I think over next six month, one year time frame, uh, almost all the organizations, so the API management vendors, uh, heavily focus on the governance and uh, use these AI technologies to API governance as well. So we already started, and I'm sure others also doing that. Uh, so in addition to that, standardizing uh, frameworks will uh, come into market. Uh, so I think uh, if you look at the next five-year time frame, API governance will be very prominent. People will uh, discuss more and more about the governance because that is more important than ever uh, right now as I see. So then, uh, so that's about the governance. So then I'll discuss a bit about the API revenue models and the monetization. So API uh, monetization and the governance always goes in hand in hand. Uh, let me explain why that happened. Because uh, if you want to sell something, you need to govern it properly. Uh, if you have a proper governance process, then only you can sell these APIs as a digital products because uh, nobody will buy from you if you cannot guarantee the uh, delivery. If those are not secured enough, then people won't buy that from you. So then uh, when you implement proper revenue model around API, you need to focus on access control, quality assurance, compliance, usage limit, monitoring. Uh, so likewise, these things you need to focus. and. Uh, uh, these are directly related to governance because for so for example access control you can directly control with the governance so quality assurance you can control with the governance compliance usage limit all these things you can uh, control with the governance so you need to uh, think about these things together first i think uh, if you want to monetize your apis you should implement proper governance process so then only you should come to uh, monetization part so then uh, if you look at the api revenue models uh, direct revenue, indirect revenue, these are like uh, two main models uh, we are using right now. But uh, if I go back to history, uh, like the John Musha, who is the uh, founder of uh, main, main API related entity, so he did uh, talk sometimes back and he explained 20 API uh, revenue models. So almost all the API revenue models we are using today based on that speech. So, but if you look at the today market, Mostly we are relying on direct revenue model and the indirect revenue model. So direct revenue model means you are basically charged for your API usage, number of API calls, uh, number of uh, connections that you make, likewise. So indirect revenue models include like uh, you get the APIs free, API calls free, but uh, through the services or product we sell through the APIs, uh, we get the revenue. So these are the two models. Most of the time when you plan your API uh, monetization strategy, uh, you can focus on these things and see what is the best model for you all. So then uh, when you implement uh, effective API monetization within your organization, uh, as an API management platform, we need to do certain things. So as an API management platform, we should provide proper way to track the usage. Because to implement, to you all to implement the monetization, we should be able to provide your usage data. Otherwise, you cannot measure how people use your API. So then uh, billing integration should be possible. So then on the other hand, uh, rate limiting. Rate limiting is directly li uh, related to your APIs and the business plan. So because uh, you, if you define some policy like gold, then you will get a different limit. And this rate limit is quite tricky because, uh, so most of the time when rate limit, when we say rate limit, we think it's number of requests per minute, number of requests per day or something like that. But if you look at the APIs like uh, GraphQL APIs, uh, you can do just one call, and from that single call, you can uh, read through entire graph. So that is something you can do with the one call. Uh, so if you look at something like GraphQL, request-based rate limiting is not sufficient. So in that case, we should be smart enough to do the complexity analysis and do rate limiting based on that. And on the other hand, if you look at something like uh, Async API, 
So for example, let's say WebSocket API. Uh, there's no point of having a rate limit based on number of requests, because they're directly related to number of consumers that you all are connected, how many topics you exposed, if it's a, like a topic-based scenario. So likewise, uh, rate limiting is not that simple or something we should uh, rely on the request count. So as API management platform, it should be able to understand each and every protocol separately and implement effective rate limiting policy per each protocol. So then uh, subscription management is uh, again something important. Uh, so the gateway uh, support, so basically manage this traffic, enforce policies, all these things happen in the gateway. So your gateway should be smart enough and it should be scalable uh, to cater this demand as well. So then SLA management. Again, uh, managing different SLAs uh, is crucial. Uh, scalability and uh, those things are goes together mainly, uh, uh, like focusing on the reliability aspect, scalability and SLA management. So then having proper developer portal, because uh, users will get all the details about their consumption through the developer portal. So if you have a developer portal, uh, which have billing integration support, will be very helpful uh, if you implement proper monetization strategy. Okay, so I think uh, that is what I need to cover today. Uh, so I think I'm on time. So if you have any questions, uh, I can answer them, or else we can wrap up session for today.